Thank you for tuning in to the World Builders Anvil, episode 120. How did it all start? Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place that will help prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. Let's sup from the mug of Java and build. Welcome back. As always, I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. And I'm Michael Miller. And we're here today. Jeff, how did it all start? You're getting ahead of yourself. No, I was just getting ahead of you. Okay, that's true. It's not too hard. Okay. You should challenge yourself more in the future. I, I try to. I try to, you know, put myself up there. Yeah, about, you know. Make it make things difficult for myself. Sometimes I'll go to make a bowl of cereal and I'll just put the bowl in the other room. Just even though it was right on the counter, I'll put it in the other room. You know, I have a lava pit in the other room. So I have to somehow make it across the lava pit to the cereal bowl just so I can have a bowl of cereal. I like to challenge myself. Well, okay. Whew. Yes. And today's topic. We're Jeff, just how did it all start? <laughs> <laughs> so really the joke here is. Originally, we planned to do this episode, I think, a month or two ago. Yeah, something like that. And um, we decided to skip it because I had no idea from the headline what it was about. And it's about cultural myths. And uh, one of the most basic things, uh, probably the well, most common. M- more specifically, like creationism myths. Yes? Well, it, well, it's from cultural perspective. Well, right. But my point is, like, you could say cultural myths, and that covers a whole lot of things, and we're specifically talking about creation. But I'm saying, yeah, the the, crea- the the creation myths are the most common form. I don't know if you can really truly call them all creation myths, because they come from different places, and that's what the episode's about. What do you mean they come from different places? Well, uh, so essentially you have five categories and i got this from a wikipedia page so it's so it's totally true totally true because it's internet. in the internet yeah it's yeah. on the internet of course and they have out of chaos <clears throat> earth driver out of nothing emergent and world parent myths and so the reason i kind of go over this episode is i like to develop creation myths and i might not know all of the details but a basic flow of how it's going to go because it helps you get in the mind of a culture And early on, what forms the culture are the development of the basic belief systems. Yep. So, like, how the world came to be Mm -hmm. is, you know. And the whole point of myth. Why why are we here, Jeff? Yeah, exactly. And we've talked about myths before. No, like today, like, why are we here? Uh, To do a (laughs) recording of an episode. Uh, The creation myth was I pushed record. I don't think that's what I'm asking you. I think you're reading too deeply into it. (laughs) I am. (laughs) That's my job. Do you get what I'm doing right now? Mm Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm challenging myself. <laughs> Funny. It kind of feels like <laughs> you're displacing your challenge onto me. No, see, the challenge is is having a conversation with you because you're just <laughs> arduous. <laughs> well, so I was watching this documentary on arduousness. You would watch. <laughs> I bet you have a series of documentaries on arduousness. They're cataloged in the other room. Let me show you. Hmm. Well, it's behind the lava pit. We'll Push. start between A and and we'll go to double Z. Do you know what I found out yesterday? You can't die, um, uh, like the way movie. It was basically this thing that showed that talked about how how movie deaths are fake. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, we know this, but specifically, they're talking about one of them was talking about lava, mm-hmm. and they're like, you can't like drown in lava or sink in lava or like you. You'll just hit it because it's so dense. Of course, mm-hmm. it's you know molten rock. Yeah. You'll just hit it and. As if if you were to jump into lava, you would just land on it yeah. and then burn to death. Well, one of the things people don't realize is the earth floats, um, the the continental plates yeah. on it. So it obviously has to be more dense. Uh, so, yeah, that makes sense to yeah. me. Even though I do like the visuals in movies where they show the things. <sighs> yeah. The thing, the thing that annoyed me in the article is it talked about, um, like, terminator they're like he wouldn't sink and i'm like well duh that's not lava that's liquid metal and yes, he's uh, yeah. and he's melting into it it's not, not magma it's not magma <laughs> <laughs> all right creation myths yeah so the first thing is and we kind of gone over very quickly why it's important and and really that, that's what it is it's to get a, a mindset for the culture so when you're going back into them if you have a, an idea a basic flow you know come up with three things 
to describe the myth. Um, and it might take a little bit more than that. Like, you know, maybe you know a little bit more and you want to put a little bit more down. But at least three things that sort of give you an idea of what they believe on how the world started. So the first one I want to talk about here is out of chaos. And when I say out of chaos, what does that conjure in your mind, Michael? Mad Max. It's a Mad Max creation theory. Yes. It could be. It could be. But essentially, it's where the world is or the universe is in chaos. Well, uh, allow allow me to throw a question out there that that you were actually answering as I interrupted you. Um, Is that out of chaos referring to the world was created out of chaos or the creation myth was created in a world out of chaos? It is literally the myth states that the world or maybe the universe came out of uh, uh, chaos. Okay. So all of these... On all the five that we have here, describe the the myth in question. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. And within them, I have a couple written down, and I'm not going to deliver the whole myth because, as Michael can verify, I could tell a 17 hour story on me walking from my desk to my car, and nothing happened. I've heard this story; it's riveting. <laughs> we should do it. We should do it in a, a, like a, a series. Like maybe well, that, maybe for the summer series, it'll be the walk to the car. Oh, that's we actually, like, no, that's we, actually we, going to be the tabletop. We trim it down to like 14 episodes. That's going to be the tabletop game you're playing. Excellent. I can't wait till we get to the mailbox. Oh, it's a great mailbox. <laughs> 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 um, I think what Jeff's basically saying is um, he did some really great research on on these, and he's just going to footnote some of these. And mm-hmm. you're going to use sam- examples of real cultures yes. and like real earth cultures not gardual cultures there might be a bonus at the end oh there yes. might be a bonus gardual mm-hmm. cultural myth yeah, yeah there okay. might or two well then don't let it me depends hold, on don't the, let me hold you back oh yes so, and there's a whole documentary i'll show you later about it too. okay great <laughs> <laughs> okay so the first one <clears throat> these are just ones that either i knew about or i kind of quickly read over and they seemed interesting to me so i apologize to the cultures who i'm about to quote Okay. Okay. So these aren't ones that like you know from your own history, uh, and okay. So some of them I've uh, I've run into like the Mandy culture, which I apologize because I probably just slaughtered that name. West African culture. This one was very fascinating because essentially, the way I understand it was the creator created like an egg in the midst of all of the chaos, and then from the egg, it was sort of like I think like the Earth maybe came out or something like that. And then he created seeds inside of it. It was a very different, very nature sort of based approach to where the creator is really creating the animals on the earth and humans ultimately to sort of help bring the universe out of chaos. So that was sort of an interesting one. Did he mention what happened to the show? No. Seems like a big hole in the story. Got a big egg and a world and a universe came out of it. Where's the shell? Mm-hmm. Uh, the shell is the floor, but it's actually in the middle of the sea. So it's one of the island ones, you know. Where... I think you're making that up on top of your myth. Maybe. I okay. could because it's all going off memory at this point. You know, so it, it's sort of trying to explain, you know, essentially why there are animals and and most of um, the more powerful creatures in the culture are animals, um, which is not too shocking. Uh, that's very common and sort of especially hunter gatherer cultures the other one is the sumerian one which tell me if this one sounds familiar the names could be different to protect the innocent the gods uh essentially kill off the old planet uh it, it bored them or something you know they're you know gods and usually when you use the word in plural it's worse than having one because um, <laughs> they get jealous and angry. Exactly. And, you know, they start God wars, and but they do it in a specific way with a flood. Ba-ba-bum. Yes, they flood the whole earth to kill off humanity. But one of the gods warns the hero and gives him instructions on how to build a boat, which she called an ark. This is Sumerian. This is a Sumerian, and obviously it predates the biblical. Story. Oh yes. Well, maybe. I mean, it's hard to tell because the Hebrew religion was very ancient and it wasn't written down until Mm -hmm. later, but it was written down in Babylonia. Uh, But it's very much the flood story with some minor differences. Like it essentially rained for seven days and seven nights instead of, I believe, it was 40 in the Bible. Mm -hmm. It was a worse flood even. Yep. 
essentially the the, the uh, storm cleared and they touched down and that was where um, life came from was this chaos of a storm. Now, that one I find interesting too because you can argue, um, and there are probably theologians who would that the actual the, the the story of the great flood is actually also a creation story. You know, there are multiple stories in the Bible that you could call a creation story. Mm. And uh, that's really one of them, you know. I don't know how they came about if one's older than another one. I know there's a theory, and it's a pretty interesting one, where they, they're they pretty sure, due to looking at the sediment on the bottom of the Black Sea, that it was a lake up until like ten or 11,000 years ago. And the they, bo- can't, they can't nail that down? Uh, well, it's pretty close. <laughs> they have an idea of when. It's within the existence of modern man. Essentially what happened was the Bosporus essentially eroded a little too much as the the ocean, the Mediterranean was filling up again, and it raised up enough that the water shark went over the Bosporus into a giant waterfall filling up the entire basin. And there was probably a lot of people who actually lived in that basin because there was a lake at the middle. Yeah, fresh water. A lot of people were probably killed in it, and it probably had an impact in – that's one of the reasons I think it might be such a common flood stories are very common mm. and in some places it might be due to the river systems, but in the Middle East specifically, they think it might actually be tied back to, to the flooding event. of the black sea. So yeah. um, whether or not that's true is irrelevant. And just to clarify, while this is a fun little history re- lesson, because Jeff is referencing real cultures, mm-hmm. keep in mind that, we're doing that as an example for yeah. your fictional cultures. These are myths that have occurred on Earth, but mm-hmm. whatever world you're working on, you could use these or create your own, and we're still talking about out of chaos. Out of chaos. And the idea is if you want an out of chaos story for your culture, you create some kind of chaos in, that is the universe or maybe just your planet or maybe just where they live, and the gods come and they clean it up. You can argue the Greek – um and I believe they listed the Greek one under a couple different ones. Mm. But the whole idea of the the mean titans and the, titans, the war yeah. uh, that led to the gods and, and humanity being the way they are, uh, you could argue that's also. And a lot of these I found, if you really read the stories, that you could probably kind of classify them in any direction. The interesting thing is to remember is when you're making it based on your culture, you know, what's important to them. You know, those are the things they're going to try and explain that exist. If they don't believe in mining, they probably don't have a lot of stories about um, the formation of metal. Uh, fire might be an important story, but that's that's a little bit after the creation, usually. But the idea is, you know, for an out of chaos story, the centerpiece of the story is this idea where there's a chaos existing, and the gods are are doing something to either bring the chaos under control, or enough for humanity to help finish the job um, and humanity usually being a culture that actually develops the story not necessarily all of humanity I, I find it interesting do do you know of any um, there's got to be some where a creation myth uh, or even maybe not necessarily like a creation myth but like a myth that talks about the beginning of a culture not necessarily the beginning of the universe of the world where they don't reference a higher power where they just reference themselves like oh we did this we brought this about like some you know egotistical man-made creation myth. not that i know of, but I think everyone that- always goes with the sky god or the sun god or or just some deity or multiple deities well yeah but i think it's mainly because they have no they have such little understanding of nature when these stories are created mm. they're looking for an explanation of how does this thing that support us get here see i think I choose to believe that it's something deeper than that. I choose to believe that it, there is an intrinsic level of man that believes in something. There that's is bigger. There's actually a proven themselves. thing talking about it. It's the idea of what they call God of the gaps, mm-hmm. which is sometimes a, 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 an atheist counter argument, you know, saying, Oh, you're just trying to create a God of the gaps. And there's actually this part of humans that when they can't understand something, want to place it upon a higher power. Mm. And that's something just built into our, well, is that nature? <clears throat> but it will is that is that us yearning for explanation or yearning for security? 
Um, you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? The, or, 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 or is it us actually having an innate desire to believe that there's something bigger than us? Which, I mean, obviously, planets, the universe, you say, well, I forget about God. There's a lot of things bigger than us. Yeah. Fine, but I'm talking about a higher power. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, I, I think it, it, it's really feeling, uh, a need psychologically the evolution has built this mechanism into us so that we don't screw up too bad because really the ultimate evolutionary trait that you learn if you're a critter that survives is to survive Mm -hmm. and if you don't have a huge respect for what's around you that you don't understand you might go a little too quickly into it so it's one of those things that might help keep you from pushing out too far too quickly even though humanity sort of likes to, so, I think, live on so, the edge of that. So even if there is no immediate environmental threat to be afraid mm-hmm. of, there's still a reminder that there's something out there. Exactly. And, and you have to respect it. You can get away from that a lot if you have a world that is actually sort of a short, created world where the where the cultures don't evolve a lot because, you know, they just appear there and then the, they won't have the evolutionary build up that will cause them to put survival first and that's ultimately the problem as things evolve the next generation's just better at surviving you know one of the weirdest things i find in looking at like the evolution of creatures is the ones if you pick two and said watch a short video which one made it you're almost always wrong you know you're almost always wrong on which one survives because usually they're super well adapted to the environment they're in and when the environment changes which it always does they go bye bye hmm. so yeah, before are you ready to move on to earth driver earth driver you're going to like earth, earth driver i'm sure i will but before we do i'd be remiss if i didn't make uh, a, a a nostalgic reference to don gaston he was my uh, philosophy psychology and um economics teacher in high school mm-hmm. and when he was talking about uh creation in i believe philosophy class it's mm-hmm. like oh well how did everything come to be and it's mm-hmm. like some people believe the big bang theory and some people believe this and believe that mm-hmm. and he's like what if there was just a big pink cloud that always was and always will be and when it floated through poof the world came into existence <laughs> you know yeah. so the big pink cloud chaos theory mm-hmm. i just wanted to mention that because he was a great teacher yeah no and that was like a, a very good lesson he knows Really, we still grasp at that. You know, we don't know where life came from. We don't. We think we know where the universe began, but we don't know. And we don't know if something's behind it or not. Mm. You can't. Okay, the next one is Earth Driver. Earth Driver is interesting because it typically deals with aliens. <gasps> yes. Yes. Finally, you admit it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, this is the island one. So I, I, I apologize once you get into the Mandy because I was mixing up things in my memory. Uh, this is a Cherokee creation myth where there's this planet island that's anchored down into the ocean. So Atlantis. No, it's anchored down so it doesn't float away in the water. So Atlantis. But above water. Well, it was. And then essentially it, it kind of falls into one of the typical nature narrative creations where, you know, the bunny comes and he eats the thing and then things start springing out of things when they do stuff. They like poop and there's like a deer and then the deer poops and there's like a, a lion who then eats the deer. Um, I'm making up some of that. I was about to say, did I miss something? I feel like I just went on an acid trip because we were talking about Atlantis and then you started talking about animals pooping animals. Because essentially, I, I didn't lose time there, right? You did just you say did not that lose time, okay. but essentially... They came down like the forebearers for the the creatures on Earth. They actually came down to Earth. That's the Earth driver thing where they come down. They aliens, the bunny aliens, and, and oh, and you the, didn't mention they were bunny aliens and wolf aliens, and essentially okay. everything in nature aliens. Okay, so but the point is that they're they're referencing that all this stuff came from a second place. It came from somewhere came, outside. Came from somewhere out and out in here. When it comes from somewhere outside and comes in. That's an Earth driver, Earth driver myth. or insert your world name here, uh, driver. Garduel driver, myth. Garduel driver. Yeah, uh, those are actually illegal in Garduel. They're, well, I'm sorry, they're illegal. Aliens? Oh uh, yes. Or bunny aliens? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay. Well, no, they're actually the bunny aliens are invited over for dinner to be going in the oven. Yes. Jenny's going to be very upset with you. I have to make sure to tag her when I post this. <laughs> you should. <laughs> And my favorite one is there's a Nigerian culture called the Yoruba. 
And these guys go full throttle into it. I appreciate them. There's a god called, I think it's Thul. Uh, he's actually scouting planets for habitability. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> and um, he ends up finding this kind of crappy one. Earth. Earth. <laughs> so why does he choose to inhabit Earth? He terraforms it. Oh, very good. Did they use the word terraform? They did not use the word terraforming, but... Oh, I wish they did. That would have been but, the best. But the whole idea that he's scouting out all the worlds to find habitable ones, mm-hmm. and then when he doesn't find one that's quite good enough, he'll push it over the top. Nice. He'll prep it, and then all the life would spring out from there. Thanks, Sewell. So I think that's like the best Earth Driver example that I read, because it's like really like, okay, he could be an alien. Mm. I, wait, was he in Stargate? I don't know. It might have been. Okay, emergence. So, so tell me about the Mayans. <laughs> so the chief god is trying to um, uh, create the legacy of the gods. Okay. So so, so they have a, like a polytheistic kind of like Greek god sort of setup? Exactly. Okay. And ergo, chief god. Chief, well, that's why I asked. Yeah. And um, he actually starts building monuments um, to, to try and find the perfect thing that really encapsulates the gods and so like, like like a totem or a statue or something. oh no like like the like mountains rivers trees oh oh I animals see. gotcha humans <clears throat> and he keeps working until he finds the perfect item okay maze corn 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 yes so he created the entire planet to create this one monument of corn but think about it corn Especially in Mesoamerica, but throughout parts of America where there's agriculture, staple crop that brought life to the civilization. Yeah, absolutely. Mines I not will. capable of existing without maize. So the thing is, they're under their creation myths really focused on the creation of really one item, which is corn, which feeds their people and allows their civilization to spring up from it. So it's another great example of a good myth that isn't. Like what I would have thought of as a typical creation myth yeah. coming into this, you know, I was where, surprised to hear it. Yeah, yeah. It's oh, wait, it's all to make corn. corn. Really, corn? Yes. I'm sorry, maize. <clears throat> sorry, that's, maize. That's before they G- GMO'd it. And the other one are, I believe, the Zuni people. Now, the interesting thing with theirs is there are two worlds that exist, and there is the world of light, and the light is wonderful. There are plants and there are animals and they're galloping. It's a nice little happy hunting ground kind of place. This is still emergent. This is an emergent one. Okay. And there's another world already exists. It's called the world of darkness. Okay. Guess who comes from there? Us. Us. And darkness was first? No, they're both. They both coexist at the same time. Okay. We are trapped in the world of darkness. And there's this world of light, which is where life is and bountifulness and wonderfulness. Okay. And so sense- I'm probably there. No, because you're you're beneath humanity. No, I sh- I'm probably in the light place. <laughs> but then again, I'm just assuming that that darkness is below lightness. But it is because the chief. That's all a matter of perspective, Jeff. If you're standing on one side looking down, it could be up to the other way. No, because they came up to it. That's why it's emergent. Unless you're standing, then it would the, be. Uh, on the, if you're upside down, it doesn't matter. Then it would be like divergent or some other thing that would be a copyright violation. Uh, Jeff, don't you know the enemy is always down. <laughs> Yes, and that's where the people are. Okay. I, did, did I just make a really grand science fiction reference that you didn't pick up? Pick yeah, I up? did not pick up at all. Have no. you ever read Ender's Game? Uh, no. Oh, you should. You told me about it. Ender's Game and Ender's Shadow. Mm-hmm. You but, should read them. You should read there. them both. Well, um, so let's briefly segue. Um, okay. There's probably – there's like more than 10 books in the series. I have not read all of them. The first book is Ender's Game. The second book is um, – Oh, something Boulder's for, Gate. Something for the Dead. Um, Speaker for the Dead. Okay. And I started to read Speaker more than once mm-hmm. and, and couldn't really get into it. One of those you just could not get I started. Just, and I yeah. wanted to get into it, mm-hmm. but I couldn't. <clears throat> Ender's Shadow, however, I don't know if it's the third or fourth book. Ender's Shadow is basically the story of Ender's Game told through the mm-hmm. eyes of a different character. Yeah. It's not all of Ender's Game. It actually takes place a little bit before that. It gives a lot more back backstory to that character mm. and then all the events of ender's game and a little afterward mm. but it's all through the eyes of a different character so it is it's a brilliant read after having read ender's game yeah. and knowing what's going on mm-hmm. 
and seeing everything from another character. I mean, point for the it's both, very, it fills in gaps. Yeah, and stuff like it's that, yeah. it's really really good. So hmm. I can't recommend that highly enough. Ender's Game and Ender's Shadow, which have nothing to do with zebras or um or uh, Pueblo, <laughs> Pueblo or Zuni or Zuni. Um, <clears throat> yes, but essentially to go back and start over again here because we didn't really get or quickly. Start I, w- over I again. was following. Um, World of Light, World of Darkness. People are. Stuck in the darkness. They must have read Plato or something. Except me. I'm probably in the world. Or maybe Plato was spying on them. And that's why he came up with the cave analogy. Possibly. Possibly. I've read but, Plato. I'm in the light. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so am I. <laughs> okay. No, no, you're in dark. <laughs> so their chief god comes down and actually goes into the cave deep, deep down. And he finds the people and he actually... Helps them to come out into the light. And that's why it's emergent. Okay. And that's also probably why they live in caves. That and it's really hot where they're from. So it's probably actually a bit cooler if you're in the cave during the day. But, um, yeah. yeah okay. They actually, he brought them literally out of the cave. He was, he guided them from Plato's little trap of mm-hmm. ignorance <laughs> right on out. Look, stop listening to him. Come with me. It's much nicer outside. <laughs> yeah, I know. Plato, you're so depressing. Shut up. <laughs> Go to Greece. So, Plato's Republic, another, yes. another, another. Uh, since we're, refer- since we're, we're recommending books today, go read Plato's Republic. Yes. Forget um, it, forget Aristotle. <laughs> and, well, Mr. Label Pants. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, we're getting into the world parent. Now, the world parent is essentially there's another world out there with the gods. Okay. And in the two examples here, they both kind of suck. Um, one's a Greek one with so let's make. I, I was actually going to ask, is it Greek with the Titans? Titans and, okay. is one. Like I said, you could argue that they're also out of chaos because of the war of the gods. Yes, yeah, definitely. But uh, I, I put them more here uh, when I was putting through there. And, and uh, if you don't know the story to that one, very briefly – there are essentially the old gods called Titans, poor Atlas, who gets all of the work. And um, he's the guy who you see holding up the world in pictures all the time, <clears throat> in case you don't know. The reading about the Titans, uh, that's another book, actually. Uh, you know the one I'm talking about, the big yellow Greek god book. Um, There's, you know how many big Greek god well, books there allow are? Well, allow me to uh, elaborate. I wish I could remember the name of it. I used to own it. Um, it's kind of intended for... So uh, I have a big orange one. It's kind of intended for a young reader. It's it's uh, there's pictures in it. The words are written very large, but it gives really good explanations mm-hmm. as to who all the Greek gods mm-hmm. are and how the world came to be and the, how the Titans and everything. Mm-hmm. So if you want, like, oh, I wish I could remember the name of it. So there is this this Greek book. This Greek, uh, it's like a you know, it's a teaching book so mm-hmm. that you can teach them. But it talks about the Titans and how they came to be and how the world came to be. And of course, Zeus and all that stuff. It's, it's really great. Yeah. I wish you could remember the title because people should totally get this book. It's a great book. Yes. The other one I want to go into here, uh, this is more of a children's version one. It's like the book I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, the, 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 the myth. creation yeah. myth is more, this is like one you tell your kids before they go to sleep. It's the Aztec. Just to terrify them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the Aztec creation myth. And essentially, uh, once again, there's this other world where the gods live. Mm. And so the gods start having kids. But their kids are all about just freaking fighting. And then um, there's a queen who has, who rules over the gods. They decide to kill her. The kid? Yes. Why? No, all of the kids. There are several kids. Okay. And they all decide to kill the mom because, well, that's what you do. She's the ruler. They want to be the ruler. Gotcha. So they decide to ice mom. Mom? Decide to ice mom. <laughs> mom has a baby at the moment they kill her mm-hmm. who is born at his full age. And, and it, is known as the day walker. Uh, no. No. Okay. He's much nastier than that. He essentially is born in full armor with weapons. And he starts slaughtering all of the other gods. Poor mom. <laughs> Essentially, it cuts up all their body parts and disposes of them. And that's why you need to give the blood to the earth to keep the earth alive. If you don't give the blood to the earth, the earth will die. How did the earth come to be in this part? I the, missed that part. 
because that's the way you sacrifice to get the gods to help feeding, to help preserve the world where they all killed each other. Well, that all, but that all sounds like it's coming after the part where the world came to be, which I think I missed the world coming to be. The, the, it's, it's just, it's a parent world. It's the older world. So it takes place in a physically different location than Earth. Okay. Like Mount Olympus is not on top of a mountain. It's just a different place. Yeah. Um, and so is this world where they happen. So he had to kill and slaughter all of his siblings and cut their body parts into bits as a sacrifice to keep it going because the queen mother's dead. And now the Aztecs have the obligation to feed it blood, which is why they were merchants of sacrificing the blood. I mean, it's like the, all the Mesoamericans to some degree get sort of painted with the light of the Aztecs. Not fair. Not the Aztecs were unusually bloodthirsty. Uh, everyone gave blood, whether or not you wanted to. Um, I mean, like, Said I, I've seen statistics where they think upwards of fifty thousand people a year. That just that's. Yeah, didn't, we, didn't we talk about this on a, on a, prior, a little bit, prior, yeah. prior episode where where the the greatest warriors were um, were not the ones that killed the most. They were the ones that brought home the the most alive, brought home so they the could be sacrificed. That's right. And hostages is not a fair word because they weren't going to be. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's no no, no 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 ransom for you. <laughs> well, you could be ransomed from the afterlife, maybe. Maybe if you're lucky. <laughs> but you're gonna bleed all over that that pyramid. <laughs> See this altar just yeah. for you and him and her and him and the guy behind him and that guy. <laughs> yes, but uh, one of the things I want to do with this episode is give you some real concrete examples of actual. Jeffrey remembered creation myths from Earth. Go for it. Um, well, those are the ones. Oh, I thought you were um, going to list a couple more. And and, 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 <laughs> and the idea is, you know, you come out of chaos. You know, your world comes out of chaos, a storm or a maelstrom or uh, asteroids. I was actually going to mention that, yeah. Smashing around. You have Earth drivers. You have these things that actually come down from outer space and start doing stuff on you out of nothing. There, there's a another less common one you might have heard of where like this guy came down and created the heavens and the earth in like seven days. That's not very well known, so I'm not going to go too much into that one. But that would be an out of nothing creation story. I don't think I've heard um, that one before. No, neither have I. Uh, emergent, <laughs> uh, which is where uh, humanity usually comes out of something and explains why they're there and why maybe they live the way they do. And then world parent, which is usually – not good. I mean, I mean, I didn't read through them all, but the two I, I read, you know, they're tough gods when, you know, they're from a different planet and they come here. Mm. Who knew? So something it sounds like you should take into consideration when you're uh, creating your myth for your culture. And all of this is just to add depth to your culture. It's mm-hmm. just, it, like <clears throat> you need to think about, remember, going back to the personality of your culture mm-hmm. episode where we talked about giving your 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 culture of basic personality traits and treat them as a singular person as opposed mm-hmm. to a mass of people. But think about them as a mass of people for a moment. Yeah. It, it, how much do they understand about the world around them? How long have they been around? Because obviously... What do they need explained? R- what do they yeah. need explained? Obviously, you know, we have ideas on how the world came to be, but your average modern man mm-hmm. doesn't think that a god farted out the earth. They generally believe about the Big Bang theory, mm-hmm. or a lot of there's they a might lot of, believe that God played a role in that happening, but right. Yeah. And there's of course a lot of cre- creationists mm-hmm. out there who believe in. You know, I mean, I I believe in Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. but I believe that I also believe in evolution and the Big Bang theory. Mm-hmm. So my so I I just make it work for myself. Yeah. I believe that God had a hand in it, and He can make it look to us in any way He wants. So. Yes. Of course, there's evidence. It. It, of course, there's evidence of evolution because God put it there. Well, <laughs> well, and who knows too? I mean, maybe it's just God. God's way of, exp- you know, our way of trying to explain what He did. If that's what you want to believe. So right. my, my my point is though, is like where is this culture timeline wise? How mm-hmm. advanced are they in their schools of thought and philosophies and what have you? That's going to give you an idea of what they would create for yeah. how things came to be. And the thing to keep in mind is this is usually one of the very first types of things they're going to come up with. So they're going to probably be relatively primitive at the time. Well, now, At the time of creating the myth. At the time of creating yes. the myth. However, depending on the exact biology of the creature, how long they've been around, that might not be true. So you can play with that. That's one of those things where you can really play with as a world master is maybe 
it wasn't so important where they came from, but where to go right now because it's a really tough environment. And maybe they, they came across that myth later. So you can't play with it, but in general on Earth, most of them are, are probably sort of relics. People sort of like me saying what they remember from the story to the next person and until they get a better way of doing it. And we talked a little about this before in the past too. A lot of times when, when, when myths come about, there might be variations of the myth, but there might have actually been multiple creation myths in Christianity and the Adam and Eve one got picked as the main one when they constructed the Bible and Noah's got slapped back at the end because it's really also a creation story. And I think even a catechism when I was a kid, they called it a recreation story um, because God was recreating the earth. But it's really just another kind of a creation myth. Well, if you want to get nitpicky. Yeah. God That's was, what I do. God was angry at man, mm-hmm. which is why he brought the flood. So it wasn't necessarily That's creation. exactly what the Sumerian gods did to create this world. But it wasn't, but the world was already created. You're thinking of the planet, <clears throat> but it's the life. It's the people who are here, oh, okay. the nations. Fair enough. You know, in theory, if it was the same planet and before or after, creation myths don't always explain where the planet, the earth comes from. Like you saw the Cherokee have like an island floating with uh, chains to hold it down until someone retracts it. We call it Atlantis then. That, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> you know, so there are lots of ways to get to it. Now, a couple quick bonus ones. There is my dragon creation myth, which is an out of nothing story. I think I remember this. And the idea of that one is, is there is the sort of, we'll, we'll call him the tribunal because that's what I've called him for years. He doesn't really have a name. Think of him as the god of physics, maybe, but a little more attached than that. And then he created the first three gods at a tree on a piece of earth floating in nothing except for the three gods and the piece of earth and the tree. And when he created those things, they got bored. And they're sort of floating out in the ether. They're not even really in this plane of existence. And there's just nothing out there. They're really bored, but they're extremely powerful because they're gods, at least if you ask them. And I imagine they're not very powerful by comparison to the tribunal. No. Okay. <clears throat> not in the same ballpark. Essentially, you have the god of order, which is Festus. And Festus uh, believes of of bringing structure, but there's nothing to structure, so he's bored. Mystere is is the goddess of nature, of life. She, uh, once again, is not giving birth to anything, and so she feels kind of useless. Yeah, but she's got that tree, so... She's got the tree, but the tree actually, she came out of the tree. Uh So, um, and that's actually, the tree is a symbol of what was here before. So there's actually a recreation in that as well, where that's what's left over from before. The last time this all happened, because it's a circular story. And it it always ends and starts about the same. It's all happened before. And it will all happen happen again. again. Yeah. And so they're like Borg. Borg is Borg. He's the god of chaos. The opposite. Borg. Borg. Okay. The god of chaos, the opposite. For half a second, I thought you said bork, 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 bork. <laughs> uh, he's the opposite. So right now he's kind of bored as well, but he's actually looking interested because who knows? And so then, so Festus and, and, um, Mysteritas get it on and she starts giving birth to everything. Uh, Mysteritas is your, Elf race, is it not? That is also the name of my elf race. Interesting, isn't it? But I thought, um, I thought you just said actually her name is Mystere. I'm that's sorry. what I was gonna say. I thought you said the name differently. All right, All so right, so right. Festus and Mystere. Yeah, I, that's why I wanted to make sure for on record you had that. Yep. And so <laughs> Mystere starts giving birth to life, and life just starts taking over everything. Life is everywhere. The problem is life unstructured is boring. Life unstructured is not boring. Boring. I was about to say it isn't. Yeah, it's chaotic. I was going to say that sounds like something that that, it needs to be something that needs to be structured. So Festus wants to start structuring. So Festus wants to start structuring. So he starts structuring the world. Mystere also feels like she needs help because stuff's not being created enough. There's not enough stuff. So she gives birth to the first race, and she actually places a dragon egg on the planet. The dragon egg, egg gives birth, and the first dragon's born, the children of Mystere. Now, 
Boric starts trying to get stuff to be, could this tree be a little straighter? Why does there have to be a bend in the branch? He's trying to fix stuff. So he he starts. Boric is trying not to. Not Boric. I was going to say Festus. Festus is doing this. All right. <clears throat> and, and he's trying to get stuff straighter, making it look right. And at this point, Boric is sort of floating in and out because he's a chaos god and he's only half interested in what they're doing anyway. But the problem is when you start to overstructure things, then it introduces the element of entropy. And entropy starts slowly decaying the world. But now he needs help in actually getting stuff more ordered, more structured. So he gives birth on his own because he's a god, I guess, mm-hmm. to what the, to the giants. And these are the true giants. These aren't the little ones that you run into in the world. These are the big boys. They're giant giants. Think of like storm giants from like Greek mythology. Really, really big gods. Well, not really gods, but they might be considered if you use a, use a human walk into them. It's a god. You yeah. probably would consider it that powerful. And, um, so they start going around and, and they, they're shaping mountains to be a little bit more correct. They're going through doing all this stuff. Borg still is just not interested. It's like, okay, things are starting to die now. Things are alive. And there seems to be this battle between life and order. So he creates this race called the Prima. And he's supposed to bring enjoyment to the world. No one's no no enjoyment yet. No enjoyment yet. <laughs> you would have thought that, that you would have thought that, and, and you know. Mystere would have would have been on that one. Now they start going around and they just start doing whatever floats their boat. The prima, the prima. They are they are the picture of perfection. They are the most beautiful race ever. The most intelligent race. The strongest race. They have the magic of dragons. They have the arson ability and magic ability of. Giants, they have all of the skills. So when we do our campaign, I want to be a prima. <laughs> well, you're not going to like how the story ends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so then the prima start going around doing their things. But then over time, some of the races start to get annoyed because the dragons are realizing the giants are killing stuff. And these freaking prima just kind of come out of nowhere and just think they can do whatever they want to. And, oh, they can do magic. Bear. Who do they think they are? They can do magic better than me. <laughs> and, you know, oh, they think they can shape stuff better than me. They can do whatever they want to. They can make stuff. They can use magic. What? So there starts to be tension building up. Between the different races. And and with that, the gods actually come down to the earth to guard Duel, I should probably say. Yeah, that's a better. Yeah. And and when they come down, due to the power, the, the, the growing rigorous belief in them, they start commanding their minions to do stuff directly. Which starts leading to Festus and Borks, uh, people start fighting each other. And the dragons are kind of like, eh, I don't want nothing to do with this. But then over time, they get pulled in too. So you start having this war where the gods and their play creatures are doing this massive war all over the planet. People are dying. The mountain ranges are no longer perfect. They become shredded and knocked down and battered. Landscapes are getting trashed. Exactly. Uh, races are getting destroyed. And, um, <laughs> but no, no one can win. I mean, it's like really, you have like three really powerful things with three really powerful creatures. But the problem is the Borg, Borg's people, the Prima keep getting more powerful because they can make and use magic. And so in the space of a hundred years, they have spaceships. They can go anywhere in the universe. They just leave. <laughs> they just go. They just go. And actually, Bork doesn't really care that much because he was kind of bored with the whole war thing anyway. So he kind of goes, and he returns back to the ether. And then Mystere, the dragons and the giants at this point are really just kind of going at it. Forced conversions, you know, all of the worst traits of big uh, religious early governments are happening where it's like, you are now going to worship Mystere. They're like, no, 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 we won't. Oh, we'll kill your whole village. And then finally, we've learned this new word. This word will allow us to paralyze the giants and kill them all. But we need to gather them all up in one spot so we can use our magic on them to paralyze them and we can kill them all. Is the word stop? Uh, well, it's in dragon, though. <laughs> Is it really stop? Hold on for a second. <laughs> it's the dragon word for stop. Is it really? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Do I get an extra point? Yes, you get an extra point. Sweet. 
Uh, so I want to use that on my character sheet when we start the campaign. They start doing stuff. They go to the very center of the universe where that tree still exists. And the which dragons is, do? Yes. And, I know and they have access to it. Well, it's now here somehow. And the, the story never really explains that because it was in the ether before. Of course. It's the reminder of what used to be. The giants start coming because they see them all building up in the most holy area in the universe. From here, you can go anywhere in the universe. And there are thousands of planets all over. And do, and do the giants spot, know that? Oh, yes. Okay. They've been doing that. They're seeing life throughout the whole universe at this point and causing death to start happening all over the universe. So the giants start coming in these big shimmering silver ships that just float through the air. And then as the two forces start to emerge, one spaceship just kind of comes down, lands in the middle, and the Prima come out, and they're like, they're all false. They're not God. And they're talking about the three gods. The three gods. Yep. <clears throat> uh, Bork is amused. Um, Festus is ripping. Oh, he is mad. Enraged. So, he, and remember, he's down there. So he starts going... And literally, he pulls this giant mace out and just starts whipping through the Prima, through the gi- – everything is just starting to get trashed. Which and, has got to please Boric because now you've got the god of order causing chaos. Causing chaos. And so the chaos is swirling around and it starts to overwhelm. And then Mystere the gets pulled into the battle and they, 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 they cut her and from her is born a new god, Thorax. Thorax is the god of revenge, who, upon his birth, summons a giant asteroid down, which comes down and lands exactly where the tree is. Now, it shatters the gods, and they're thrown off the plane of existence. The Prima disappear. Uh, the giants... As they were created. You know, and, and, and the things just all seem to go away. And then no one knows how much time passed. But then the dragons and giants started to wake up again. And they started seeing that there was life coming back to the planet. And they could see, you know, like these weird little animals and all these things that weren't even really there before. And they're all just kind of moving around. The entire place is now just a giant ocean of super depth that, you know, is no, no, no more tree, uh, nothing there anymore. Um, except a big ocean surrounded by islands that did not exist before. Some pretty high altitude bones. It must have been a pretty big asteroid. And they can't find the Prima. And then ultimately, over time, they start to realize that some of these strange animals each have the traits of the Prima. So you have the beauty, which sit in the elves. You have the strength, which, you know, sit in, you know, in the orcs. You have this... Ability to adapt, which sits in the humans. You have all, every, the, the whole race shattered into all of the new races. And that's how the world came about. That's how Garduel world came about. According to dragons. According to dragons. According Just to dragons. ask them, they'll tell and you. And they were there, they'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that is our. That's a great, creation that's a great myth. creation yeah. myth. That's yeah. a really great creation myth. Yeah. No, I had fun with that one. That's probably my best thought out one because. It was originally the way it started, and I had my timeline of, you know, this is the age of rage where the war of, you know, is going back and forth. And then I realized later on, as I sort of, I'm like, no, this is actually the dragon's creation myth. Oh, we're a child of the god. Yeah, it's better that it be a myth and not a fact. It could be. It could be fact. <laughs> it, it could, could be. be fact. Yeah. But, but now mm-hmm. the no thing is, substantiate it. the dragons are highly atheistic and, and, they discourage belief in gods. <laughs> the dragons are atheistic. <laughs> because they realize it was the faith that allowed the gods to come to the world. And when the gods come to the world, bad things happen. So they're trying to push a less strength to the gods. Mm-hmm. Yeah, smart. So they're fighting the gods in their own way. But they're cursed. The giants are cursed. And the prima are like everything now. So... So they're gone. Are there are there still any prima out in the universe? No, no, no. Hmm. Giants? Oh yes. Yeah, the giants are still out there. You know, the giants are out there, but they can no longer fly in their ships. Hmm. They've been bound to the planet. They have a rampant desire to negotiate. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a weird one. But they're also wonder. They have a wonder lust. Hmm. They can actually. The only things that can sail openly into the. Uh, 
Maelstrom on Gardul. Mm. So they're the only ones that can really go out to sea without being destroyed. And occasionally one of their silver ships will come out of the water. So it reinforces the dragon store. These guys are here, but they don't, they're, they're there to trade. They have some really cool equipment, giant metals, exceptionally nice. If you get a hold of it on my planet, they're the only ones who can make it and they can whip it up for you. They'll trade it for food and all the stuff they need, but then they get bored and they leave. Hmm. Dragons are also cursed. They are a natural extension of magic. So, like, literally, the words they speak are magic. Uh, their thoughts can be magic. Um, they've banned that word. Stop. Yes, you can't say stop a dragon because that helped lead to the end of the first world. The first basically. world. Yeah. They're limited. They have very small numbers. Whenever they're met, they're hated. People fear them. They will do anything to destroy them once they see them. Hmm. Uh, but dragons can change their form. They can look like anything. But they cannot change their mass, which makes walking across certain bridges rather difficult. <laughs> so there is uh, the sum up of that creation story. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I enjoyed it a lot making it. Um, now for the world builder task of the day. I'm sure this is going to come as a shock as many of our, our world builder tasks are. We obfuscate them so well. Create a creation myth for one of your cultures and consider more for your other cultures. Yeah. You know, and really for the, the, the less important the culture is, the less you need to know. Just understand if you like, what kind of creation myth is it? What's the ultimate goal? And you know, what is the beginning and what are they creating? That's really all you need. Uh, what about the real world task of the day? Step outside and appreciate the world that's been created for you. Because it's your world and we're just living in it. Uh, how about the tease for next episode? Humor in your world. And as always, make sure to go to Gardul.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com for the show notes. They'll be under podcasting, world builders, and that's a great place to get all of the information from the episode that you just listened to and to see all the resources that we've talked about in this episode. Thanks for joining us in this episode of the World Builders Anvil. Please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes, and please help get the word out to your friends about our show. And join me, Jeffrey W. Ingram at Garduel.com to see the progress of my world and learn why I made the choices I did. And please contact me and let me know the topics you would love to hear in the future. Now strike, why the myth rolls high. <laughs>